wanted something more from life, you had to go outside to get it. If you can't get money here in Harlem, you can't get no money nowhere. You heard of Dweeda Hallway? Well, this was the real Dweeda Hallway. Al Paul, AZ, and Rich Porter. They was the mayor of Harlem, all three of them together. The small fry motherfuckers that was running errands, man, for the niggas back in the 70s, was bosses, man. It's like everybody here is Michael Jordan in comparison to using the NBA. Everybody that a superstar. The Harlem niggas was the most super flamboyant fly niggas on earth, man. Even the, even the big dudes that was in Queens, the big dudes that was in the Bronx, the big dudes that was in Brooklyn, they was all coming to Harlem. It's coke, it was dope, it was crack. Everything was selling. I don't think nobody in the city was moving coke and crack like was going on at Harlem. We was the youngest niggas probably in history to ever do it the way we did it. I wasn't the richest thing in Harlem. But he was one of the most popular because of the shit that he was doing. Well, people knew him as Alpo. I knew him as Negro. He was just like every other kid in the hood, man. We was all trying to find something to take our mind off the fact that we was fucked up. Because everybody thought he was black, but he was just a dark skin Puerto Rican. That nigga speaks Spanish very well. The 70s and 80s was wrong. The state of black America is still very grim. Moms were well fed, no dad. problem with somebody or something like that and his moms come down his moms are like be like yo that's my son don't touch him she'd be on the front line Paul just for some reason always stood out his mother always had him into you know she was always taking him like to camp he was going away to fresh air pond we all did that he stayed this summer with a white family i think there was another little boy that the family had that was their son and al was like their son you know, he spent every summer with the same family. They always wanted him back. He was just part of the family. We just accepted him to come. We just liked to have him every year. He, he really was a good kid. He, he, nobody, I, I can't imagine anybody not liking Albert. And that proved to be the case once he got here. You know, when you, the your first time you met him, you just liked him. He, he adapted to that, which, which was good, because he was able to see, um, different people grow up. Going to the boys club, wanted to be a Marine, wanted to be a cadet. And they loved him over there. I mean, you can go to 3rd Avenue on 111th Street, and his pictures were everywhere. If you didn't have a strong structure, it's like you could easily lose it because you'll be outside, you don't learn how to try to make a buck. We have a community filled with drugs, and on the streets we have young people who seem hopeless and are hopeless. They have no guidance by looking at the motherfucker that was working, the nigga that was working was struggling. It was three of us, me, Paul, my man, one of you know what I mean? And us three like that, you know, we was about one man. Like any other kid, he didn't want to be depending on his mother all the time. Anybody that know each of a project is right on the, uh, right on the drive. So, we would take a garbage can, throw it on the FDR drive. And that's slow with traffic down, if we go to the back. When it can just, you know, niggas just walking them all side the, like the, the barrier, do you see that white chick with that purse open, with that yak, or that nice diamond chain or whatever, and we just yap it. Jump back over the wall, run through the projects. But I guess that didn't work out for him. He got a phone call from his mother, I think. Asking if he could come up here. When he came up the last time and we asked him what trouble he was in, eventually when he told us, he said he was a runner. You know, and we, you know I think he said that was carrying drugs or something from one place to another. I really remember when he was real young and a, a certain OG around the way had him on the corner. Yeah, I produced work for me back in the days and shit, you know? And uh, he was out there hustling. And I was like, yo, what that nigga doing now? Why are you always out there? He said, man, that nigga... You know, he's selling that shit. You know, Paul, when he first went out, he cold as hell. So Paul was really trying to get that money. I see he really want that money. You know, you got to be out there 6 in the morning to fuck with the heroin and shit. So I probably was going to get a nigga at 5.30. We still be sleeping. Paul come out, you know, be early in the morning. And he have a knock to him already because he don't caught no fans. You know what I mean? That nigga started popping. He was about 13. He was, he was, he was like one of the youngest cats out. He, he started real young. It was the, that very last time that he came. And he must have been only like 15 and a half.
up and he had the big chains on, the big gold chains. The kids around here noticed these things immediately and started asking questions. At this time and age, that might be normal, but I'm talking about back in 78. You understand, a 13, 14-year-old kid, you know, 79, that wasn't normal. He was very street smart, very, and he would observe everything. The nigga had the eye of the tiger, and he was hungry, man. Paul wasn't drinking, Paul wasn't smoking no weed, Paul didn't do nothing, you know? Paul was strictly about getting paper and putting that shit away. It's some shit like LeBron James got, he got it, Michael Jordan had it, Paul had it. My nigga Al met my man Shorty Love, and my man Love showed this nigga the way what this is. His game wasn't aggressive at all. When he got with Randy, the, the beast came out with him. When Alpha met Randy, somehow Randy had to an aggressive defender. I 
mean, uh, people started seeing the lines, and I, I mean, it was ridiculous, man. I mean, that's why that, that's why you had to follow up everything at one time because you never knew when the crowd was gonna be there, you know. And and, and, and I mean, it was ridiculous, man. I mean, you know, we had we, we used to have to tell people, y'all stand on the other side. I mean, that's how much that joint was moving. And I mean, you, you, if you think about it, we was giving them close to a, a, a half a gram for ten dollars. We learned that a prominent athlete has died because he took cocaine. You couldn't go buy this from nobody else. You couldn't go buy the material that they had. They had it really fucking good, man. When Poe went over there and got that money with the West Side nigga, got introduced to AZ, this big player, young kid in the game. The nigga just totally just took charge of shit, man. You know what I mean? A didn't have to tell him what to do and how to move. He knew how to move. You know what I mean? The nigga was a wolf. He was kind of aggressive. You understand what I'm saying? I guess A took a liking to that. And, you know, he immediately put him down. I believe Alpo wanted it more than the, the, the other cats that was around me. He wanted to see how far he could take that shit. Like, he was more like, I want this shit, man. I love this shit, man. He was destined to be rich, man. And he used to test me sometimes. You know, he used to give me a certain amount of bricks and tell me to go find him up. You know, he, 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 he didn't play that. You know what I'm saying? Like, he didn't play that, man. You know? We had to sit down there and bottle him. Ten bricks. He gonna sit down there with me and make sure each, you know, bottle is bottled before he go out to work. Because the spot on 45th Street was moving so fast that it was doing two or three bricks a day. You know what I'm saying? A took a liking to him because it was about his business. Say, for instance, can, can they give me a hundred bricks? And they say, okay, give me a million dollars. I'm not gonna bring the connect back. Nah, a hundred. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure they have the, that penny to make it a million dollars. Even if a nigga fucked up my shit, whatever, that's not their business. That's my business. You understand? I take it out of mine and say, here, yeah, boom. Why? Because as soon as they say, I say here, they say here. You understand? And then they be in a position like, in thought like, man, I don't want to lose this cat. This cat is loyal. And to me, loyalty brings forth royalty. You know, I seen the bigger picture. And he played fair, so it was no need to be petty, you know, because he wasn't petty with me. He had ideas, he had ambition, you know what I'm saying? He had dreams, and he wasn't letting nobody get in the way. No, no means necessary, nobody wasn't getting in the way of his plans. He never let A down in the streets when it was crunch time. When we was young, and we was down in hell, we was getting paper, a whole lot of it. And there used to be dudes down there getting short paper. They wasn't really getting no real paper, but, you know, they didn't extort us or nothing like that, but they would wait for A to leave, and then they'll go stick the joint up. You know, A was the, is the kind of person that's, you know, he, he don't want the problem. He called a semi-meeting with Stanley, his brother, and asked him if they want the spot. Now, he gave opportunity for anybody that was in the crew before Alpo came along to get the jukebox. But they were so used to being spoon-fed that they wasn't ready to leave the nest. Everybody was used to kind of everything being smooth. You know, when you was working with A, everything was just smooth. It wasn't no headaches. It wasn't no murder game or none of that. So when it came to me, I was like, hell yeah. I went in there with a broom and swept up all the bullshit, and it became...